Previously on World of Warcraft. What you have done here, Sylvanas, it goes against the laws of nature. Disgusting is the only word I have to describe it. Warchief, without these new Forsaken, my people would die out. Our hold upon Gilneas and Northern Lordaeron would crumble. Have you given any thought to what this means, Sylvanas? What difference is there between you and the Lich King now? Isn't it obvious, Warchief? I serve the Horde. Watch your clever mouth, bitch! As previously mentioned, guys, I have come up with the uh, video ideas for the upcoming weeks. We are going to go into Garrosh and Warlords of Draenor next week. Following that is possibly going to be Illidan or someone else just before that because Illidan is a fan favorite, but I want to make sure you guys have enough of the storyline to understand his storyline, but also at the same time be entertained by it because there are quite a few cutscenes and cinematics involving Illidan that are absolutely magnificent when you have the context. Out of context, they look really cool, but I want to make sure you guys experience the full magic of the cinematics. So I want to make sure you have all the context that you need so you can enjoy it as much as we did when we watched it for the first time. Let's get started with the story of Sylvanas. Hello everyone. Last year I did the story of the Headless Horseman for Halloween and since I can't tell the same story twice, for this year I've decided to go with the story of Sylvanas. Her story is one of my favorites and I might not be able to tell all the little details, but I will do my best. Let's begin, shall we? Not much is known about Sylvanas before the first Horde invasion. We know that she comes from the Windrunner family and most of you probably know her sisters. You have the older sister, Illyria Windrunner, who joined the Alliance of Lordaeron in their battle against the first Horde invasion. She also stepped through the Dark Portal after the Horde's second invasion to try and prevent the Horde from invading different worlds. She fell in love with the human paladin Trevelyan and they made the ultimate sacrifice of closing the Dark Portal on Draenor's side to prevent Azeroth from being destroyed. Many believe that the Alliance expedition was gone forever, but the Dark Portal reopened during the Burning Crusade and we discovered that several of the members were still Still alive. So for you guys that don't know, the Dark Portal is what the Orcs use to come from Draenor to Azeroth, which is the human world. That's the gateway that they use to go from one world to another. Basically, it's a far away world or planet on the other side of the cosmos, and that portal acts as a doorway. However, Illyria and Trevelyan, they're still missing, and we have no idea where Sylvanas' her older sister currently is. Now her younger sister, Verisa Windrunner, she was sent on a secret mission to help the human mage Ronin. They would eventually assist with the liberation of the Red Dragon Queen Alexstrasza, and on their journey, Verisa and Ronin grew closer. Ronin would become the leader of the Kirin Tor. They would have two children together, but tragedy struck at the bombing of Fedamore. Ronin, he sacrificed himself by drawing in the mana bomb to control the explosion and save his wife. He even managed to push Jaina into a portal before the explosion hits, and his sacrifice saved many lives. That's going to be a little interesting story to go into later with Garrosh, but the decision to drop a mana bomb, it's the equivalent of a nuclear bomb. And um, <clears throat> it was Garrosh's idea. Jaina was pissed. Ronin's death would have a great impact on Verisa and by extension Sylvanas, but we'll get to that story later on. Now for Sylvanas, she describes herself when she was young as very vain. She was beautiful, even for high elf standards, and she was a very skilled hunter, the most promising one in her family. This skill, this talent, would earn her the title of Ranger General of Silvermoon. Sylvanas was actually the commander of all of Quelphalus' military forces, and like I mentioned, the first time that she shows up in the story is during the first Horde invasion. The Horde, by this point, had already taken Stormwind and were on their way to conquer Lordaeron. Enduin Lothar took as many of his people as he could from Stormwind across the sea, to warn the Kingdom of Lordaeron about the Horde and get a fighting force going. The nobles of Lordaeron, they formed the Alliance of Lordaeron and Lothar's bloodline goes back to the Arafi bloodline. The Arafi, they aided the High Elves many years ago in the so-called Troll Wars and the High Elves have promised their aid, their allegiance to the descendants of the Arafi bloodline. However, 
The High Elves, they did not see the Horde as a threat to their lands. They relied on their magic to defend their own home, and they only sent a token force to aid the Alliance. Illyria Windrunner, she disagreed with her leader's choices, and she volunteered to join the token force in the war against the Hordes. She believed that the Horde could be a threat to all of the world, not just the humans, and she would be proven right. Eventually, the Horde, they marched upon the kingdom of Quel'Thalas, and Illyria, she wanted nothing more to run back home and warn her kin. But Torellian, he kept her in line. There was no way that she would make the trip back home on her own, even though he himself wanted nothing more than to warn them. But they had to be smart and they had to stick together. Part of the Alliance, they marched to Quel'Thalas as the Horde already began their assault. The trolls who had joined the Horde, they had been enemies with the elves for centuries and they could not wait to kill every elf they could find. From the trees, they swooped down, they took up patrols, as the rest of the Horde, they made ready for a full assault. Once the Alliance arrived, they could see that fires were spreading across the forest and that the Horde had already begun their assault. Trellian, he wanted to work together with the elves, he wanted to coordinate their attacks, so finally he could give Illyria the freedom to run back home and warn her people. In the meantime, the Alliance kept the Horde busy and Illyria first ran into her sister Verisa as a pack of trolls dropped down from the trees. The trolls, they outnumbered them, but they didn't know the forest as well as Verisa did. Together with her sister, they ran to a stream, the trolls closed behind, so close that they were nearly grabbed, but just before they could, the trolls were shot down by Sylvanas and her troops. Illyria took one of the troll heads with her as she met with the council to convince them of the dangers right at the borders. At first the council didn't want to listen, but when they saw the heads, they knew that her words were true. Their king, an Asterian Sunstrider, he was outraged that the trolls dared to invade their lands, and he now committed the full might of the High Elves military forces to the Alliance. Led by Sylvanas Windrunner and her second in command, Lord from Arfaran, the High Elves and the Alliance, they crushed the horde between their two forces. Things were looking up as their plan was obviously working, but the hordes, it was no pushover. They released their ogre magi and they even had dragons breathe fire from the sky. And this, the Alliance simply could not take. On top of that, Quel'Thalas was obviously not the primary focus of the Horde. They had set their eyes upon the capital city of Lordaeron, so Torellian, he was forced to take their troops and chase the Horde before they could take on the heart of the Alliance. Sylvanas, her people, they still had their magic, their sunwell to protect their city, and not even the dragons were able to penetrate those defenses, so for the moment, their people would be alright. The Horde laid siege on the capital city, and they probably would have won the war in a day or two, was it not for Gul'dan. Gul'dan felt no allegiance to the Horde, all he cared about was getting more power for himself and he knew that there was power to be found at the depths of the ocean. He split his forces away from the Horde, which forced Doomhammer to send his own troops after Gul'dan to take revenge upon this traitor. In the meantime, the Alliance had also cut off the Horde's route of reinforcements and Trellian, Sylvanas, Illyria, Lorfmar, all of them were assaulting the Horde as they tried to take the city. All in Just to give you guys a little bit of context, the Horde typically does have a central leader or a warlord but the horde itself at that time had multiple warlords and they all had their clans uh gul'dan was one such warlord and what he ended up doing during the invasion was he basically took his force on their ships and said fuck you guys i'm going this way because he wanted to get some magic and glory for himself meanwhile the rest of the horde invasion was doing their own thing as you can see they didn't always get along and they weren't the most coordinated force in the world no, things were simply not looking good and Doomhammer had to retreat all the way back to Black Rock Mountain. The Alliance, they followed the bulk of the Horde as the High Elves made sure to clean their forest of any invading forces. Not a lot of details are given about this fight, but we do know that Sylvana, she lost a lot of her people to the Horde's invasion and a lot of her own family, including her little brother Lyra. Upon finding this out, Illyria went off the deep end for quite some time as she saw how much damage the Horde had done to her people and she devoted herself to killing every single orc that she could get her hands on. Sylvana, she had her own forces to lead as they cleaned up their lands and due to their allegiance with the Alliance, she allowed a human to join the ranks of her Farstriders. Nathanos Maris became the first and last of the human ranger lords despite Sylvanas her people objecting against this. Sylvanas didn't care what her people said, not even kill for Sunshine was able to force her to send Nathanos away and some of the fans speculate that there was more going on. That there and so began the biggest cuck lord in WoW lore was more to Nathanos than just his skill that attracted Sylvanas, but that's purely speculation from the fans. It would make sense though, we have Illyria who fell in love with Trellian, we have Verisa who fell in love with Ronan, and Sylvanas perhaps with Nathanos. 
let's just look at it this way. They had a thing for elves. Like, like at this point, everyone was trying to bag themselves like one of the Sylvanas sisters. Sorry, one of the Rinru uh, Windrunner sisters. And Athanos is like, you know what? I'm going to get the Ranger General one. That's the one I want. Who knows? What we do know for certain is that the Dark Portal would reopen and the Horde returned for a second invasion. Sylvana, she did not join the Alliance expedition as they battled the Horde, but her older sister Lyria did decide to join the troops. Before they stepped through the Dark Portal, she sent out her friend Verana to bring a gift to her sisters. Illyria realized that there was a very big chance that it would never return, so she wanted her sisters to have something to remember her by. From a necklace given to her by her parents, she made three individual lockets. One emerald, one ruby, and one sapphire with an inscription for each of her sisters. To Verisa, with love, Illyria, and to Sylvanas, love always, Illyria. Verina told Illyria that she would keep the locket safe until Illyria would return, and then she could give them herself. But as we know, Illyria would not return, and the gifts were delivered to her sisters. This ends the story of the first and second Horde invasion, and it brings us to the events of Warcraft 3. Over time, the Alliance and the Alliance of the High Elves, it would weaken. With no major force to fight and to unite them, the kingdoms, they started to fight amongst each other about where to spend their gold, what to do with the remaining orcs, and this also meant that the High Elves, they stayed more to themselves. This is kind of why in Europe you had different kingdoms intermarrying. It wasn't necessarily only to broaden power and land, but it was also to secure alliances. So say, now I'm not the best on my European history, but I do know that the English, uh, the French and other kingdoms in the area, they would marry. You know, once prince would marry a princess, that would, you know, forge that alliance quite literally through, you know, a marriage and then they would have kids and it would mean it's less likely for one kingdom to betray another because you know they're married and they have a kid who's heir to basically both thrones they don't want to you know topple that ship um that didn't end up happening in the warcraft universe you know no one ha came up with the idea to uh you know marry so uh <laughs> but it also doesn't help that the elves live for thousands of years if not forever whereas the humans obviously after a human lifespan end up dying so that didn't help the situation but look it is what it is it's its own world it's got its own complicated political system the Lich King, who was sent by Kill Jaden to weaken Azeroth and summon more of the Burning Legion, he made contact with the human wizard Kel'Fuzad, and together they worked on spreading a plague across the kingdom. This plague did not only kill, but it also resurrected the dead as forces for the Scourge. The Prince of Lord Ron, a young paladin by the name of Arthas Menifil, was sent by his father to investigate the reports of this plague. Together with Uther the Lightbringer and Jaina Proudmoore, they saw how their people were converted, and they even managed to kill Kel'Fuzad. Killing the wizard did not stop the plague from spreading though, and at Strathholm, Arthas had to make an impossible choice since the plague had already reached the city. Disguised as a shipment of grain, the citizens had baked it into the bread, and there was no telling who had already eaten from it. Oh no, we're too late. These people have all been infected. They may look fine now, but it's just a matter of time before they turn into the undead. What? This entire city must be purged. Arthas made the choice to purge the city, while Jaina and Uther, they turned away from him. Inside the city, he found the Dreadlord Morganus, who taunted Arthas to meet him in the cold heart of Northrend. Gather your forces and meet me in the Arctic land of Northrend. It is there that we shall settle the score between us. It is there that your true destiny will unfold. I'll hunt you to the ends of the earth if I have to. Do you hear me? To the ends of the earth! And so he did. Arthas was able to stop Melganus by picking up the cursed blade known as Frostmourne, but by doing so, he gave up a piece of his soul. Now he too was listening to the whispers of the Lich King, which told him to go home and take the throne from his father. What is this? What are you doing, my son? Succeeding you, father. Oh! All I gotta say is whoever the guards are in the king's chamber deserve to be fired. I know Arthur's bought, uh, brought two of his own, you know, like, vanguard with him. But it's three people and you're in the king's chamber. Just saying. Your guards suck. 
Now the kingdom was truly lost, and Arthas destroyed in days what his father had tried to build in years. His next mission was to reclaim the remains of Kelfuzad and resurrect him as a lich. To do this, they would need an incredibly powerful source of power, and lucky for them, they could find such a power in Quelphalus, namely the Sunwell. Sylvanas received reports from a scout that the undead were marching and naturally the High Elves they had heard rumors about the plague spreading across the human lands, but they had thought that they would be safe in their own city. Quelphalus had been able to stand against trolls, against orcs and even dragons. Surely this new threat wouldn't be a problem. They had made this mistake before, only this time the mistake would cost them dearly. You are not welcome here. I am Sylvanas Windrunner, Ranger General of Silver Moon. I advise you to turn back now. It is you who should turn back, Sylvanas. Death itself has come to your land. Do your worst. The Elf Gate to the Inner Kingdom is protected by our most powerful enchantments. You shall not pass. As you can tell, she's a Lord of the Rings fan. Sylvanas met Arthas on the field of battle as he tried to defend the first gate, but the might of the Scourge was incredible. Every slain enemy Arthas simply raised back to life, and her fallen forces were either converted into the Scourge, or their dead bodies used as ammunition to throw at her. Reluctantly, Sylvanas gave the order to fall back to their second gate, an order she had never imagined she would have to give. Ah, Shindufan. Fall back to the second gate! Fall back! The Elf Gate has fallen! Onward, my warriors. Onward to victory. You've won through this gate, Butcher, but you won't get through the second. The inner gate to Silvermoon can only be opened with a special key, and it shall never be yours. You waste your time, woman. You cannot outrun the inevitable. You think that I'm running from you? Apparently, you've never fought elves before. Damn that woman! We must find a way to cross the river. As you can see, her sass is second to none. The kingdom of Quelphalus had always been well defended by magic, but a traitor from within, Darkan Drafir, had told Arthas about the Key of Three Moons and how to break through the magical defenses. Blowing up the bridge had bought Sylvana some precious time to warn her people, but it did not stop the scourge. Arthas filled the water with enough corpses to create a bridge, which allows his troops to move further. Sylvana, she knew that one way or another they would have to make a stand against this butcher, and as they prepared themselves, she fought back to a time where the world was right. Where she, her sisters and her brother, they love to sing a song together. By the light, by the light of the sun, high elves, her enemies are breaking through. I salute your bravery, elf, but the chase is over. Then I'll make my stand here, butcher. Anara la Balori. Finish it. I deserve a clean death. After all you've put me through, woman, the last thing I'll give you is the peace of death. No, you wouldn't dare. And then it went away. It all went away, the coldness, the stench, the searing pain. It was soft and warm and dark and calm and comforting, and Sylvanas permitted herself to sink into the welcoming darkness. At last she could rest, could lay down the arms she had borne for so long in service to her people. And then, agony shot through her, agony such as she had never known, and Sylvana suddenly knew that no physical pain she had ever endured could hold a pale candle to this torment. This was an agony of the spirit, of her soul leaving her lifeless form and being trapped. <laughs> Why have I been summoned? Arthas denied Sylvanas the peace of the afterlife. He ripped her soul out of her body, turned her into a banshee under his full control, and he kept her body locked away in a chest just for a little bit of extra torment. Sylvanas was forced to watch in horror as Arthas took down her city and killed her king. 
An Asterian sun trider, he tried to defend his people, but he was over 3,000 years old and he was no match for the might of Frostmourne. Sylvana, she had screamed before when Arfza tortured her, but now she let out a scream like none she had ever before. The pain and agony of watching her people fall poured out of her, and against her will she did even more damage to her people. Her banshee scream scattered armor and made her people bleed out of their ears and die. Arvis had succeeded in his mission and he claimed the Sunwell. Citizens of Silvermoon, I have given you ample opportunities to surrender, but you have stubbornly refused. Know that today, your entire race and your ancient heritage will end. Death itself has come to claim the high home of the elves. Now arise, Kel'Thuzad, and serve the Lich King once again. Sylvanas couldn't believe that all of this destruction, the brutal murder of her people, was all just to bring Kel'Thuzad back to life. She was sickened by all of this, and the only thing that gave her a little breather from her agony was to see how Darkhan was foolish enough to try and betray Arthas as he had betrayed his people. Arthas showed no mercy, and he took Darkhan's life just as he had taken Sylvanas her life. Now Kul'jaeden's plan on sending the Lich King to Azeroth was to bring the Legion for a new invasion. Kel'Thuzad was put on the task of summoning Archimonde and he actually succeeded in bringing this powerful demon to our world. You have done well, little Lich. My plan worked perfectly. Lord Archimonde, all the preparations have been made. Very well, Tychondrius. Since the Lich King is of no further use to me, you Dreadlords will now command the Scourge. As you wish, Lord Archimonde. Soon, I will order the invasion to begin. But first, I will make an example of these paltry wizards by crushing their city into the ashes of history. This has got to be a joke. What happens to us now? Be patient, young Death Knight. The Lich King foresaw this as well. You may yet have a part to play in his grand design. The Lich King, he did not work willingly for Kil Jaden. In secret, he worked on his own plans of undermining the Legion, and he had Arthas point Illidan towards the Skull of Gul'dan. This skull would give Illidan the power needed to take out the powerful Dreadlord known as Tychondrius, and by extension give the Night Elves, the humans and the Orcs the opportunity to defeat our command. This meant that the Legion invasion was prevented, but the other Dreadlords left in command of the Scourge, they did not know about this. Arthas saw how Archimonde fell at the battle for Mount Hyjal, and he quickly made his way back to his kingdom. What? Who could possibly... Greetings, Dreadlords. I should thank you for looking after my kingdom during my absence. However, I won't be requiring your services any longer. Prince Arthas. This land is ours. The Scourge belongs to the Legion. Not anymore, demon. Your masters have been defeated. The Legion is undone. Your deaths will complete the circle. Never! This isn't over, human. We knew you would return to us, Prince Arthas. I have returned, Lich, but you will now address me as king. This is, after all, my land. But what King Arthas didn't count on was that the Lich King's powers were draining. Casting out Frostmourne had created a crack in the ice, and Illidan's attempt at trying to destroy Icecrown from a distance had made this crack bigger. The Lich King informed Arthas that danger was approaching and that he quickly had to come back to Northrend to merge with him, so Arthas prepared for the journey. With his powers diminished, Sylvanas found that her will was her own again. She no longer heard the whispers of the Lich King in her mind, and the time of vengeance was upon her. She met with the Dreadlords, and they made their plans to overthrow the king. Lady Sylvanas, we are pleased that you came. How could I not? For some reason I no longer hear the Lich King's voice in my head. My will is my own once again. You Dreadlords seem to know why. We've discovered that the Lich King is losing his power, 
As it wanes, so too does his ability to command undead such as you. And what of King Arthas? What about his powers? Though his rune blade Frostborn carries powerful enchantments, Arthas's own powers will fade in time. It is inevitable. You seek to overthrow him, and you want my help to do it. The Legion may be defeated, but we are the Nathrazim. We'll not let some upstart human get the best of us. Arthas must fall. The Lich Kalthazard is far too loyal to betray his master. But you, on the other hand... Hate him. I have my own reasons for seeking vengeance. Arthas murdered my people and turned me into this monstrosity. I may take part in your bloody coup, but I will do so in my own way. We have no time for this. We must find our way out quickly. You have my thanks, ladies. But where is your mistress? Where is Sylvanas? She sent us to find you, Great King. We've come to escort you across the river. Once we cross it, we'll take refuge in the wilderness. Sylvana, she had been able to recover her body from the chest in which Arthas had ordered it to be placed. Her banshees led Arthas into a trap, to the place where Sylvanas would finally have her revenge. This is the place, sisters. We'll rest here, Great King. Why here? We've got to find Kel'Thuzad before we- You have been deceived. Come to my side at once. Obey! What is happening here? Sylvanas. We walked right into this one, Arthas. It's time to even the scales. Traitor! What have you done to me? It's a special poisoned arrow I made just for you. The paralysis you're experiencing now is but a fraction of the agony you've caused me. Finish me, then. A quick death? Like the one you gave me? No. You're going to suffer as I did. Thanks to my arrow, you can't even run. Give my regards to hell, you son of a bitch. And she could have ended it there, but of course she didn't. She pulled a Gohan. Back, you mindless ones! You shall not fall today, my king. This isn't over, Arthas. I'll never stop hunting you. Kelfuzad showed up just in time and he saved Arthas' life, and Arthas would make the journey to Northrend as Kelfuzad stayed behind to rule his kingdom. Apparently, at some point during the story, Kelfuzad he either went into hiding or he relocated to Naxxramas. Either way, he kinda disappeared from the story as Sylvanas was contacted by the Dreadlords. You seem troubled, mistress. Aren't you, sister? Only days ago, we were the Lich King's slaves. We existed only to slaughter in his name, and now, we are... free. I don't understand, mistress. I thought you'd be overjoyed. What joy is there in this curse? We are still undead, sister. Still monstrosities. What are we if not slaves to this torment? and I appreciate the role you played in overthrowing Arthas. I've come to offer you a formal invitation to join our new order. Baron Mothras. My only interest was in seeing Arthas dead. I have no time for your petty politics or power mongering. Careful, my lady. It would be unwise to incur our wrath. We are the future of these plague lands. You can either join us and rule, or be cast aside. 
I lived as a slave long enough, Dreadlord. I won't relinquish my freedom by shackling myself to you, fools. So be it. Our reply will come soon. Revenge. That what Sylvanas wanted at this point. But to take out Arthas, she first had to get a home base, she had to get an army. The Dreadlords, they were not pleased with her declining their invitation. So Sylvanas knew that they would strike soon. There was plenty of work to do before Sylvanas could get her revenge. And the first step was to take on the Dreadlords. With her Banshee sisters, she managed to take over some of the local population, like ogres, gnolls and murlocs. These forces, they proved to be powerful enough to take on Varimafra's forces. But the Dreadlords, he made Sylvanas an offer. Any final words, demon? Sylvanas, spare my life. I beg you. I can be of service. I swear it. Just like a demon, you'd sell your brethren out just to save your own skin. I'm listening. I know what my brother's plans are. I know where their forces are based. Just let me serve you, and I'll help you defeat them. All right, Varimathras. I'll let you prove your loyalty to me, but be warned, I'm keeping you on a short leash. Varimafras, truth to his word, led Sylvanas directly to his brother Defarok, and there they find out that Defarok used his powers to control the humans, amongst them General Garethos. Sylvanas, she used her own banshees to take control of the humans, they opened the gates from the inside, and together they took out the armies before they even realized what hit them. Taking out Defarok released the humans from his spell, and Sylvanas made a deal with Garethos. The spell has been lifted. Is the nightmare finally over? Stand down, humans. I have no quarrel with you. What is it you want, elf witch? We have a common enemy. The last Dreadlord Balnazar currently controls the capital city of your kingdom. If you help me kill him, I'll see to it that you get your lands back. Why should we trust you? You're part of the Scourge that drove us out in the first place. Not anymore. My only interest here is vengeance. Ah, very well. I'll rally what's left of my forces and meet you outside the gates. Come now. You have no intention of giving them their lands back. Of course not. The humans are simply a means to an end. You sound more like one of us with every passing day, my lady. Watch it, Dreadlord. All three of them, they strike out at Belnazar's forces and they actually manage to take the capital city. However, before taking out Belnazar, Sylvanas had one final test for Varimafras. It's over, Belnazar. Varimafras. Yes, my lady. Kill him. But I... It is forbidden for one of the Nathrazine thank you, Matt. to kill Much another. Thank you. My defection was one thing, but this... I require one last test of your loyalty, Dreadlord. Do it. You wouldn't dare. There, your business is done. Now I want you wretched animals out of my city before I... Kill him, too. Gladly. The capital city is ours, but we are no longer part of the Scourge. From here on out, we shall be known as the Forsaken. We will find our own path in this world, Dreadlord, and slaughter anyone who stands in our way. Bound to the iron will of the tyrant Lich King, the vast undead armies of the Scourge seek to eradicate all life on Azeroth. Led by the Banshee Sylvanus Windrunner, a group of renegades broke away from the Scourge and freed themselves of the Lich King's domination. Known by some as the Forsaken, this group fights a constant battle, not only to retain its freedom from the Scourge, but also to slaughter those who would hunt them as monsters. With Sylvanus as their Banshee Queen, the Forsaken have built a dark stronghold beneath the ruins of Lordaeron's former capital city. This hidden undercity forms a sprawling labyrinth 
that stretches beneath the haunted woods of the Tirisfal Glades. Though the very land is cursed, the zealous humans of the Scarlet Crusade still cling to their scattered holdings, obsessed with eradicating the undead and retaking their homeland. Sylvanas and the Forsaken had but one mission, to take revenge and kill Arthas. Defeating the Dreadlords was a great step, but they would need more allies. Sylvana, she sent out several messages trying to find some sort of allegiance, but most of the world saw them as monsters and simply wanted them dead. Warchief Thrall was convinced by how Moorun told him that there was potential for redemption in Sylvanas, her people. Thrall fully realized the sinister nature of the Forsaken, but he also trusted Hamul and he allowed the Forsaken into the Hordes. This day Imagine this. You are the Ranger General of the High Elves. Your entire life, you were an ally to the Alliance. You gave your life fighting the undead. You get resurrected as a Banshee. You retake your body. You kill the Dreadlords occupying Lordaeron, you know, which was the human capital. Well, Arthur's killed his father, and, you know, you try to find some allies, since you have your free will once again, and the Alliance is like, no, fuck you, you're undead, we're gonna kill you. I don't know about you guys, but I'd personally feel a little bit betrayed. Just a little bit. Just, just, just the tiniest fucking bit betrayed. I don't know about you. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just weird. It not only increased the Forsaken's chances of victory against the Lich King and anyone else who tried to take them on like the Scarlet Crusade, it also gave the Horde a foothold in the Eastern Kingdoms. During one of her journeys, Sylvanas found her way back to Quel'Thalas. Some way, somehow, the traitor Darkandrafir, he managed to survive Arvis's punishments and he was trying to reclaim the remaining powers of the Sunwell. The Sunwell, it was destroyed after Arvis used it to resurrect Kel'Thuzad and this story takes place in the Sunwell comics. In this story, we find out that the remaining powers of the Sunwell, they were transformed into a living being known as Envina. Sylvanas does her best to take out Darkon, but not even her banshee scream was able to stop him. In the end of the story, Darkon is supposedly killed by the powers of the Sunwell, and Sylvanas, she promises to keep Envina's identity a secret. Darkon will prove to be near impossible to kill, since during the Burning Crusade, he actually returned once again. This time, adventurers were put on the task of killing him and collecting his head, and we can only hope that he will stay dead. Nephanos Maris, the, the first and last of the human ranger lords, he fell to the Scourge and eventually became an undead. Sylvanas made sure that he joined the Forsaken before the Scourge recruited him. Can I just point out what fucking cuckery is this? Even in death, he's cucked to Sylvanas. How fucked is that? And Nathanos is still very loyal to Sylvanas, which further supports the speculation that there was something more between Sylvanas and Nathanos. Can I just point out this? I started playing World of Warcraft Classic, which is just World of Warcraft without any expansions. And if you're leveling as a horde, and you go to Sylvanas, you know, at the end of the game where you're near max level, she will basically tell you, you need to go get some training. I've told Nathanos to go to the Eastern Plaguelands, which is a godforsaken part of the Plaguelands, where there's absolutely no Forsaken. She sent him out there to this little fucking house to kill undead. And he went there! Like, she probably did it as a joke to see how much control she has over him along the lines of, oh, Nathanos, go to the fucking ends of the earth and kill undead. And he's like, yes, my lady. And she's like, my God, he's a bigger cuck than I thought. Like, my God, man. Nathanos was still considered to be a hero of the Alliance, and the Alliance was put on a quest to restore order and release Nathanos from his undead curse. A small army was required to take down the Ranger Lord, but Nathanos, he managed to survive the encounter by feigning his death. These days, Nathanos trains new Forsaken in the ways of the Hunter. The final thing I want to mention before we talk about the expansions is the Royal Apothecary Society. This society was created by Sylvanas and it was put in the task to make sure that the Forsaken would have enough firepower to take on the Lich King. They were working on a new form of plague which would not only wipe out the Scourge, not only the undead, but also any other form of life. 
The other race of the Horde, they actually believed that the Forsaken were working on a cure for the undead illness, but in truth, they performed horrible experiments on both the living and the dead. Nothing would stand in Sylvanas' her way of getting revenge. Convinced that the primitive races of the Horde can help them achieve victory over their enemies, the Forsaken have entered an alliance of convenience. Harboring no true loyalty for their new allies, they will go to any lengths to ensure their dark plans come to fruition. As one of the Forsaken, you must massacre any who pose a threat to the new order, human, undead, or otherwise. As we all know, the Blood Elves, they entered the game during the Burning Crusade. The Blood Elves, they actually used to be High Elves, but they now call themselves Blood Elves in honor of all those who had fallen while trying to defend their land against Arthas and the Scourge. Officially, their people were told that Sylvana, she had simply died with the rest of them. But the rumor had it that there was more going on, that Sylvanas was now actually the Banshee Queen. Apparently, Sylvana still felt some sort of connection to her people, since she played a massive role in getting the Blood Elves into the Hordes. Besides that, she also offered the support of the Forsaken to secure the land against any remaining Scourge forces. The Blood Elves, they first refused her offer, thinking it was some sort of trick, but eventually they let her in and they became a solid part of the Hordes. As Blood Elves quest through the Ghostlands, they can find a necklace at the Windrunner Spire, the same necklace once given to Sylvanas by her older sister, Illyria. You can bring the necklace back to the Dark Lady, and first she says that the necklace and her sister are a long dead memory, but Sylvanas, she can't hold up that mask for very long. Her older sister still holds a spot in her dark heart, and Sylvanas, she sings the Lemonade of the Highborn as she remembers her old life. What joy is there in this curse? I'm, I'm going to be that guy, and I actually want you guys to experience the full video, because uh, I remember playing it back in the Burning Crusade, and it was just absolutely beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And World of Warcraft um, even created a whole cutscene for it. So if you grab that amulet while you're questing, she sings it for you. She gets her banshees. There's four or five of them in the background and they're basically singing along with her and she sings the song. But Blizzard actually released a cutscene for it. So I'm going to play it for you guys while I go and grab a coffee. So please do enjoy it. It's really good and it's a really nice cutscene. I certainly hope it makes it to the YouTube video. If it doesn't, I apologize in advance. If it does, please enjoy it. If it doesn't, just look up Lamnon of the Highborn on the official World of Warcraft channel and enjoy it. It's, it's really good. It's really good. <laughs>
you gotta admit blizzard actually cares about this story um one little thing of significance also from the windrunner estate which you can find in the burning crusade if you're playing through that starting zone for the blood elves um the significance of the amulet which if i co recall correctly from the quest line is sh you basically find that <clears throat> Those amulets were made when all three sisters were together. They were very young, and they basically had them as a wish of... Their wish was to all get married, to all have kids, and to all live happily ever after. Um, they picked their own sort of paths in life. Savannah's becoming the Rager General, Alira becoming someone else, and, you know, everyone did their thing. And they got separated. Little, her little brother ended up dying. And so she, she sort of had a little bit of a rough time. Another thing of significance to point out is that her younger brother was killed during the invasion of the orcs. So she's got no love for the horde. Her young brother was slaughtered in the invasion. Um, and then when she had to find allies, the alliance wouldn't take her because she was undead. And she ended up having to join the horde through convenience. Again, not the world's best thing, but... That's what makes her such a complex character. It's not one-dimensional. We played by Sasha and Tom Miller. I don't remember that Tom. Hill bed for Hill. That way. Hill bed for Hill. Hill bed for Hill had an infamous quest. My people don't remember because it was in classic. The quest line was, the bottom one runner decided, I'm going to set up a concentration camp where I'm going to experiment on orcs and the alike. So even when she was part of the horde, she was killing and experimenting on orcs. I think this is where uh, the the context of what I said earlier, that her little brother was slaughtered during the orc invasion of, I believe it was the second war or the first war, comes into effect. She didn't Please join the horde. Defend. She didn't. Please don't defend. Defend concentration camps. I'm That's not. I'm not wrong. defending concentration camps. I'm pointing out that her allegiance to the horde isn't out of some love or loyalty, but rather out of convenience because the alliance wouldn't take her. But at the same time, the alliance didn't exactly do themselves any favors in that they didn't accept any of the undead who were formerly alliance, which broke free of the Lich King's will. They abandoned them. There's, I believe, in a few books, stories of undead trying to go back to their homes and they can't integrate because they're undead. They're the enemy now. So I don't think it's a simple it's, black and white case on this it's one. It's not simple black and white, but in the same sense, for the Alliance, you have to put yourself in their shoes. They just had an issue with the undead. Now here's a bunch of undead saying... So, Hey, we used to be a friend of family. Can we be a friend again? Well, we've seen what's happened. An entire faction was formed of people that are displaced. I believe if you go through the undead um, starting zone, a bunch of the quests are basically people coping with accepting the fact that they're undead. And they either accept it or, you know, they go into sorrow and commit suicide. Or It's a very real and dark story i mean if you read through the quest logs <laughs> it's not t for teen it's actually real life shit right there people are actually hanging yep. themselves in the forest instead of being undead you know they're like fuck it i'm gonna kill myself again i don't want to be this monstrosity but um yeah it's, it's, it's always been a thing best in classic because i've always heard people say oh well you know she was never this way i sure was but, Even when she was an elf, she's an asshole. But, she was never a kind-hearted person when she was an elf. She was an asshole. There, there is a certain theme that I will keep ringing, and it will go full circle, I believe, next week or the week after. And I will say that it's hope. Her hope was to be married and have kids and live happily ever after like all her sisters. And like that amulet, you see that glint of hope for a moment. And then it goes away and it's replaced with pain. Oh, because we mentioned him, you'll oftentimes, and just for the chat, 
You'll notice when we talk about the cuck, I'm not going to say his name. I refuse to say his name. I don't believe he had the right to have a name. So I call him Douche Canoe. Because <laughs> Douche Canoe. he is the embodiment of Douche Canoe. If you look it up in the dictionary, you should, in theory, just see his face. Because he is the perfect embodiment of a douche canoe. I mean, it's hilarious. In life, he went out of his way as a human to try to join the force of the High Elves under Sylvanas. Because he, you know, had a crush on her. That didn't go anywhere. She ends up turning into the undead. And he conveniently also turns into the undead. And then he begins to cuck his way into her, let's call it, kingdom. And then she sends him off somewhere in God knows where, <laughs> some godforsaken land. And he fucking goes there. He almost gets killed, because that's how much big of a cuck he is. And then he goes groveling back to the Undercity. And, like, you know what? You'll be seeing a lot of him. But I gotta say that, like, if there was ever a story of a cuck, it is his. It is his. And he's a discount. And you'll never hear me say his name. Come on, we'll say his name. But I will not. All right, let's continue. But I will keep ringing that central theme of hope surrounding Sylvanas time and time again. Because it is central to her character and you will see why. Let's continue. Oh, one more thing. I have one more thing because I came in late and I didn't get the, get I get your opinion on that. Uh, don't let it be about the Shadowlands things. Now the, not the time. Fine, I'll talk to you about it later. All right, let's continue. Five years took place between Arthas merging with the Lich King and him waking up to strike out at the world once more. Sylvanas her people, they've been able to invent a plague that did not only kill the living, but also the undead, Forsaken and Scourge alike. Even though Sylvanas has regained full control, she still felt a certain link with Arthas, and when he woke up, she felt it in her soul. At last, Arthas, you will pay for what you have done. The humans who spawn such as you shall be slaughtered. Your scourge shall be stopped in their tracks. You will no longer be able to hide behind your army of mindless undead puppets. And we will grace you with the same mercy and compassion you showed us. Thrall was cautious and reluctant to give the order to assault nor friends, but once the Scourge struck out at Orgrimmar, he saw no other way. Gerard's Hellscream was put in charge of leading the bulk of the Horde into Norfriends, and of course, Sylvanas also joined the assault. The Blood Elves, they were also reluctant to support the war against Arthas, since they just had to deal with a civil war, and Lorfmar, he did not want to send his people off to war again. Sylvanas, she made sure that they would carry their weight in the Horde, and she paid a little visit to Lorfmar. Have you forgotten who's responsible for the state of Quelphalus in the first place? Who is ultimately to blame? She searched his face for a reply, and when he gave none, she continued. Well, I at least have not. My vengeance will not be denied, and you will give me what I demand of you. The Sindorai Rangers and Magi, as well as the Blood Knights. We cannot spare them, Sylvanas. Her flaking lips curled into a sneer. Then you can hide here like a beaten dog, if that is indeed your will, Lord Fumar. Though if you believe anything can come from it, you are a fool. Do you think Arthas will be content to ignore you whilst you wait here and lick your wounds? Do you think I will tolerate such cowardice? I would warn you, those who do not stand with the Forsaken stand against them, and those who stand against the Forsaken will not stand long. For a while now, my people have stood guard in these lands, and it is by my hand that you have any place within the Hordes. You will aid us in Northrends, or I shall cease to aid you in Quelphalus. Can we just point out that Sylvanas is a main negotiator? Let's continue. Lorfmar, he had no choice, and he devoted his people to a new war. In Northrend, the bulk of the horde led by Garrosh assaulted the land starting from the Borean Tundra, while Sylvanas and the Forsaken, they attacked from the Howling Fjords. Under the name of the Hand of Vengeance, they worked on perfecting the plague, while also taking the land. The campaign against the Lich King, it seemed to be going fine, the Alliance and the Horde were even worked together, but at the Roth Gate, Sylvanas would be betrayed by Grand Apothecary Putris. <laughs> Mindless 
Zap, sons of the Horde! Blood and glory await us! I was wondering if you'd show up. I couldn't let the Alliance have all the fun today. Arthas! The blood of your father! Of your people! Demands justice! Come forth, coward, and answer for your crimes! You speak of justice, of cowardice. I will show you the justice of the grave and the true meaning. Fear. Enough talk! Let it be finished! You will pay for all the lives you've stolen, traitor! Boldly stated, but there is nothing you can do. What? <laughs> Did you think we had forgotten? Did you think we had forgiven? Behold now, the terrible vengeance of the Forsaken! Sylvanas. Death to the Scourge! And death to the Living! Is the hour of the Forsaken. We're finished. No escape for any of us. The plague she and her people had worked on for years had fallen into the wrong hands and Putus used the plague against the Scourge, the Alliance and even the Hordes. Varimafras and Putus, they worked together in overthrowing their queen and they took the Undercity right beneath her nose. This meant that Sylvanas, she had to secure her home base before she would be able to deal with Arthas. Together with Thrall, Vol'jin and several members of the Horde, they charged into the Undercity and they took on Varimafras who was busy trying to summon something into Azeroth. Welcome to my kingdom of darkness. Did you enjoy my minion's terrible creation? Potent, is it not? But enough prattling. You wish to reclaim your city. Come then, heroes. Your souls will fuel the host. You will have this place back in pieces. What have they done to my beautiful city? The only redemption for the traitors responsible for this will be an agonizing death. My vengeance will be swift and without mercy. Lead the way, Dark Lady. Oh yeah, this is probably why I like Sylvanas. She is bloodthirsty as all hell. We will follow. 
Very well, War Chief. The royal quarter is this way. Stay on guard. There is no telling what Veramathras and Putris have in store for us. What is this? Welcome to your future. What little there is left of it. Too long. Tireless, endless planning. It will not end like this. Need more time. The master is near. Such power. Can you not feel it, mortals? Cease this foolishness and join me. I will not fail. Not again. I cannot hold. Destabilizing. You have failed me, Vademothras. A thousand thousand pardons, Master. I will deal with these intruders myself. The voice files that you hear while fighting Vadimafras, they are named after Sargeras. So it seems likely that the Dreadlord, he never truly gave up his connection to the Legion, and he was trying to summon Sargeras into Azeroth. Years wasted. The Alliance, they were also struck by this betrayal, and they had their own reasons for assaulting the Undercity. They took on Putris, and at the end, Varian and Fral, they nearly went at each other. Jaina, she was able to teleport Varian and the Alliance away from the city before more damage was done. Fral gave the Undercity back to Sylvanas, but he had learned his lesson. He left behind several of his Corcoran to guard the city, while also keeping an eye on the Dark Lady to make sure that something like the Rothgates would never happen again. Undercity was secure once more, so it was time for Sylvanas to make her way to Northrend and confront the Lich King. Together with Horde Adventurer, she made her way into the frozen halls deep inside Ice Crown Citadel. The Argent Crusade and the Knights of the Ebon Blade have assaulted the gates of the Ice Crown Citadel and are preparing for a massive attack upon the Scourge. Our mission is a bit more subtle, but equally as important. With the attention of the Lich King turned towards the front gate, We'll be working our way through the side, in search of information that will enable us to defeat him, once and for all. Our scouts have reported that the Lich King has a private chamber outside of the Frozen Throne, deep within a place called the Halls of Reflection. That is our target, champions. We will cut a swath of destruction through this cursed place, and find a way to enter the Halls of Reflection. If there is anything of value to be found here, it will be found in the Halls. The Dark Lady watches over you. Make haste. Soldiers of the Horde, attack! Your last waking memory will be of agonizing pain. Pathetic weaklings. Wait, stop. Don't kill me, please. I'll tell you everything. Why should the Banshee Queen spare your miserable life? What you seek is in the Master's lair, but you must destroy Tyrannus to gain entry. Now, within the Halls of Reflection, you will find Frostmorn. It, ah, uh, it holds the truth. Frostmorn? The Leech King is never without his blade. If you are lying to me... I swear, I swear it's true! Please, don't kill me! Worthless gnat. Death is all that awaits you. No! <laughs> Do not think that I shall permit you entry into my master's sanctum so easily. Pursue me if you dare. A fitting end for a traitor. Come. We must free the slaves and see what is within the Lich King's chamber for ourselves. I... I don't believe it. Frostmorn stands before us, unguarded, just as the gnome claimed. Come, heroes. Standing this close to the blade that ended my life, and the pain, it is renewed. I dare not touch it. Stand back! Stand back! As I attempt to commune with the blade. Perhaps our salvation lies within. Careful, girl. I've heard talk of that cursed blade saving us before. 
Look around you, and see what has been born of Frostmorn. Uther! Uther the Lightbringer! How- You haven't much time. The Lich King sees what the sword sees. He will be here shortly. The Lich King is here? Then my destiny shall be fulfilled on this day. You cannot defeat the Lich King. Not here. You would be a fool to try. He will kill those that follow you and raise them as powerful soldiers of the Scourge. But for you, Sylvanas, his reward for you would be worse than the last. There must be a way! Perhaps. But know this. There must always be a Lich King. Alas, the only way to defeat the Lich King is to destroy him at the place where he was created. The Frozen Throne. Aye. Coming, you silence must paladin. So you wish to commune with the dead. You shall have your wish. Valric, Marwin, bring their corpses to my chamber when you are through. As you wish, my lord. Soldiers of Lordaeron, rise to meet your master's call. You will not escape me that easily, Arthas. I will have my vengeance. I will not make the same mistake again, Sylvanas. This time, there will be no escape. You will all serve me in death. He's too powerful. Heroes, quickly, come to me. We must leave this place immediately. I will do what I can to hold him in place while we flee. There is no escape. Death's cold embrace. Away. No wall can hold the Banshee Queen. Keep the undead at bay, heroes. I will tear this barrier down. Blasted dead end. So this is how it ends. Prepare yourselves, heroes. For today, we make our final stand. <laughs> Nowhere to run. You're mine now. Fire! Fire! Get on board! Now! This whole mountainside could collapse at any moment. We are safe, for now. His strength has increased tenfold since our last battle. It will take a mighty army to destroy the Lich King. An army greater than even the Horde can rouse. Arthas fully merging with the Lich King had increased his powers and Sylvanas was no match for him on her own. It is up to the Horde and the Alliance to tear down the walls of Icecrown and bring the King to his knees. Now I stand. Those that have done the Shadowmourne questline and actually defeated Arthas with this weapon, they're able to get a special item after defeating the Lich King. One of these items is a vial of blood from Sylvanas, and upon returning this to her, she says... So, it is done. I had not dared to trust my senses. Too many times has the Lich King made me to be a fool. Finally, he has been made to pay for the atrocities he imposed upon my people. May Azeroth never fail to remember the horrible price we paid for our weakness, for our pride. But what now, hero? What of those freed from his grasp, but still shackled to their mortal coils? Leave me. I have much to ponder. 
What now indeed? Sylvanas' storyline up to this point was all about getting revenge, and with Arthas taken out, that's exactly what she got. Sylvanas, she made her way to the top of Ice Crown after these events, and she found out that a new Lich King was placed upon the throne. Bolvar Four Dragon had taken up the burden to be the Jailer of the Damned, but all of it no longer mattered to Sylvanas. None of it mattered anymore, her undead life's goal was complete, so Sylvanas, she looked down and she saw liberation. Sylvanas, she threw herself from the top of Ice Crown, and she embraced the cold hands of death, but the Valkyr, they had other plans in mind for Sylvanas. It showed Sylvanas visions of her past, how she used to be, and how she used to use her troops. To her, they were arrows in a quiver, shut out to accomplish her goals. They also showed her how her forsaken were the same to her, arrows aimed at Arvis's heart. They also showed her visions of a possible future, where Gerard, she used the bulk of the forsaken to take down Gilneas. They showed her how the Alliance retook the capital city of Lordaeron, and how her people threw themselves into bonfires. Again, all of it didn't matter to Sylvanas. All she wanted was to escape this eternal torment, and she threw herself off the top of Ice Crown. The Valkyr, they tried to stop her. They tried to keep her in limbo and offer her a choice. These visions were not to judge Sylvanas, but they were to show her what could happen, what could happen to her people. Let them perish, Sylvanas cried. I am finished with them. The Valkyr had no choice, and they let Sylvanas go and see for herself what the afterlife had in store. Lady Sylvanas Windrunner tumbled in a free fall. Not in the physical sense. Her body had been obliterated at the foot of Ice Crown Citadel. It was her spirit that tumbled. Lost, like a rudderless ship in a storm. How had she gotten here? She couldn't remember. Had she been killed by Arthas? Had she committed suicide? Had she been sent to judgment by the Valkyr? Time was meaningless here. Her whole life seemed not a series of events, but a single instance, a pinpoint flash of consciousness in an infinite void. She saw only darkness. And then she felt, truly felt, for the first time in a long while. She recoiled in agony. Here she was, her spirit once again feeling whole, only to feel it suffer. To feel once more, only to feel abject pain, cold, hopelessness, fear. There were others in the darkness, things she didn't recognize, because nothing so terrible could exist in the world of the living. Claws tore at her, but she had no mouth with which to scream. Eyes looked at her, but she couldn't look back. Regrets. She sensed a familiar presence, recognized it, the taunting voice that had once held her in its grasp. Arthas? Arthas Menethil here? His essence rushed to her, desperate, then shrank away in horrified recognition. The boy who would be Lich King, just a scared little blonde child, reaping the aftermath of a lifetime of mistakes. If any part of Sylvanas' soul were not at that moment torn and tormented, she might have even felt, for the first time, the slightest glimmer of pity for him. In the grand landscape of all the world's suffering and all the evils of the infinite, the Lich King was insignificant. Now the others had her, surrounded her, gleeful, tormenting, tearing at her consciousness, delighting in her suffering. Horror. This was to be her eternity, the endless void, the dark, unknown realm of anguish. Hell, or at least Warcraft's version of Hell, that's what waits for Sylvanas on the other side. The nine Valkyr, still bound to Lich King Will, they came down for her and they offered her a choice. They would join Sylvanas, in exchange they would be free of Bolvar's will, and they would even take her place in Hell, as they would be forever bound together. Not only would the Valkyr keep Sylvanas alive, they would also give her the power to resurrect the dead into new forces for the Forsaken. Sylvanas agreed to the pact with the Valkyr, and the first of them took her place in Hell, as Sylvanas carved out a new destiny for her and the Forsaken. They would no longer simply be arrows in a quiver, now they were her bulwark against the infinite. Together with her eight remaining Valkyr, Sylvanas intends to never return to the hell that she had witnessed. I dearly hope that there's a special place in hell waiting for you, Arthas. We may never know, Uther. I intend to live forever. Seems like a lovely place, doesn't it? Go on. So, um, some things you guys should know. That cinematic they showed you called the Wrath Gate, and it is for those of you who never actually played it. It is to a lot of people the first time Blizzard actually made cinematics, and it changed everything. When people saw it for the first time, 
they were amazing. A full blown cinematic in game. And the hilarious part is they gotten disturbingly good at making them. The guy who made that actually was hired on because he made my cinema. And that, and it's the hey, you want to you want a job with doing this for professionally? Um, another thing. Mashima being basically making uh, World of Warcraft videos using the in-game engine. So similar to how people used to make like Red vs. Blue or Elite World just for World of Warcraft. It was yeah. really popular back in the day. Um, so another thing to tie into the afterlife that we saw week, week, oh, well, three weeks, uh, four weeks ago. Batham. This is... Remember, Arthur was thrown into the mall. This is when Savannah was sent to the mall. By the Valkyrie. Remember, she goes right into the mall, and the very first person she sees is Arthur. That's what that is, it's the mall. When he made this video, didn't actually know what it was called. We never actually had a name for it. For the longest time, we were known as the Warcraft version of Hell. Eternal Dark. Hmm. Now we know a lot more about the app Live, but that's basically what that is, and that's why. Um. Th also, um, that the um, the Wrathgate and the Wrathgate is where the quest line ends. Back when Rathalus can happen, it was a giant question that involved going back to your city, informing them what happened, and then you gather the army, and then you either put down the left that might be the lion's path, the horde path, and then eventually they meet right at, um, and that's where Jana freezes everybody and then teleports the alliance out. Yeah, so the whole Wrath of the Lich King expansion, uh, like we saw from last week, the Horde and the Alliance both land in um, Northrend, and then you've got um, Garrosh leading the Horde forces on one side of Northrend, and you go through the entire campaign, eventually reaching the Wrathgate, which is one of the first assaults on Ice Crown, and uh, one of the first direct encounters with the Lich King. And as, as we saw, um, part of the Apothecary forsaken forces betrayed the horde and the alliance through the plague killed a lot of people like we saw and then what follows immediately after is the assault on the undercity because they found out very quickly well they thought originally that sylvanas was the one that did it but then they found out very quickly that it wasn't actually sylvanas it was the dreadlord that had taken over the undercity and then regardless on whether you were horde or alliance you pretty oh, much had to stormed the undercity and at the end of that you basically had varian that was king of the alliance and thrall who is the war chief of the horde they were basically about to go at it and jaina to prevent an all-out war you know because the lich king was still around she basically froze everyone she's like fuck this we're out and she sort of prevented <laughs> another war from breaking out but that's the context um, of it and one last thing um about the question, um, they mentioned the ice crown. The, what, what's interesting about it is people don't understand how hard that is to grasp the idea. We got to ice crown near the beginning of the expansion. It took us the entire expansion to get from one end to the other. Put that in perspective. We didn't advance all the way to the end until the very end. And that's when we fought the Lich King. Well, it's a war campaign. Yeah, the whole story unfolded like it a was, war campaign. It took... And it took getting like, a foothold um, and eliminating the Lich King's allies in every zone to eventually get a foothold in Ice Crown and then over time being able to assault the final fort. It, it, it's eventually a campaign of an entire continent. And that's what it yeah, feels like in the story. It's 2 and 11 because it's a huge shape. 
and you start here. The problem is when you start here, you have to go through undead. Hordes and armies of undead as far as the eye can see. And you have giant gates. Each gate represents another push that they have to do. And yeah, it, it's it, just... it, it was one hell of a campaign. One hell of a campaign. But sticking on topic, uh, at the end of Wrath of the Lich King, we pretty much see that Sylvanas is done. Her mission is accomplished, and she effectively throws herself off Ice Crown Citadel and dies. She commits suicide, and she's like, well, my torment is done. And she wakes up to a brand new hell. <laughs> and she's like, oh, fuck. And then you've got the Valkyr, which are effectively, um, you know, like those Norse angels, like the Varaikul, which raise people up yeah, from the dead and angel. carry them over to Valhalla. These are the Lich King versions of it. And they say, well, you know, we'll take your place in hell for you. And of course, you know, you either stay in hell and suffer for all eternity, or you accept the deal with the valkyr of course she says yes be my valkyr now she's got eight so you can think of sylvanas as having her nine lives and using one of them up when she jumped off ice cream but it, here's up. the thing here's the thing let's not get into too Very, much detail this was just introduced i'm, so not, I'm, not, I'm not i'm not i'm not i'm going to explain barker's just because she has eight doesn't mean they're all equal Certain Valkyrs have more power than another. So certain ones require multiple Valkyrs to equal Savannah. Because they have to match her power level. The whole time. What he's basically saying is, in the first case, the one Valkyr could sacrifice herself for Sylvanas. But later on, not all of them were as powerful, so sometimes it would take two or even three. Alright, let's continue before we get I'm going to go about them. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Let's continue before we get off topic. Though Lady Sylvanas and her Forsaken finally took vengeance upon their hated enemy, the Lich King, their dark crusade in Northrend proved costly. Betrayed by Grand Apothecary Putris at the Battle of Wrathgate, the Forsaken's devious plague of death was unleashed upon both the Alliance and the Horde to calamitous effect. Unbeknownst to Sylvanas, Putris and his demonic ally, Vera Mathras, had taken control of the Undercity. As a result, the Forsaken were wrongly blamed for the traitor's atrocities. Though the Undercity was eventually retaken, Sylvanas and her followers still bear the weight of Putris' sins. Mistrusted by the other members of the Horde, the Forsaken must now prove their loyalty to the cause and redeem themselves from their supposed treachery. To this end, Sylvanas has bolstered her defenses within the Tirisfall Glades and readied her undead forces for any contingency. As one of the Forsaken, you must use your cunning and viciousness to slay any who would pose a threat to Sylvanas's rule, be they human, undead, or otherwise. In one of the visions shown by the Valkyr, Sylvanas saw how Garrosh was throwing away her forsaken troops in order to take Ilneas. Upon returning, Sylvanas told the Warchief that they would take Ilneas, but they would do it her way. No one would squander her forsaken away, she needed them as a bulwark against the infinite, and not even the Warchief would take them away from her. To understand the battle at Gilneas, we'll have to talk a little bit about the history of Gilneas and their people. Gilneas built their gigantic wall around their city sometime after the Second War, so sometime after the First Horde invasion was defeated. It was part of the Alliance of Lordaeron, and their leader Gen Greymane, he placed the support with the other leaders. Greymane was not much of a team player though, and he would rather spend his money on defending his own kingdom and his own people than working together with the rest, but he didn't go as far as betraying the Alliance. The Alliance, they would eventually win the war against the Horde, and over time their allegiances would weaken. Greymane took it one step further, and he built a massive wall around his city, allowing no one to set foot in his land, so they wouldn't have to concern themselves with other people's problems. Hmm, a giant wall. Hmm. 
His wall was very mighty, but not strong enough to stand against the Scourge and Arvids. When the undead roamed the land, Gilnane's forces tried to stop them, but they were decimated. Desperate, Greymane asked Archmage Arugal for aid, and Arugal, he summoned the Worgen to attack the Scourge. The Worgen were summoned from the Emerald Dream, where they were placed many years ago by Malfurion Stormrage himself. These Worgen, they actually used to be Druids, who tried to contain their powers of the demigod Goldrin, but instead of containing the powers, they lost themselves to the Fury. Their bites would even spread the Worgen curse to other people, and Malfurion, he saw no other way than to place them in hibernation within the dream. At first, the plan worked great. The summoned Worgen were a great fighting force against the Scourge, but then the Worgen, they turned around and they attacked Gilnean people, slowly spreading their curse through the city. These Worgen were led by Ralar Fangfire, also known as Alpha Prime, the first of the Druids who had turned into a Worgen. He had infiltrated Gilneas through tunnels under the Grey Main Wall, and he was searching for the Scythe of Loon, which he could use to summon more of his Worgen brothers and sisters from the Emerald Dream. With these additional Worgen, he planned to assault their nests and take revenge upon Melfi Furion, and to this end, he allied himself with the Forsaken and their assault against Gilneas. The invasion of Gilneas it took place in several stages, and it's a little bit too big to cover all the little details, but I will do my best. At first, as I just told you, Geralt threw the Forsaken at the Gilnean wall, but the wall was able to hold. Alpha Prime, he attacked the city with his worgen, to which King Greymane allied himself with Lord Darius Crowley. Darius had led a rebellion against Greymane in the past, and he was imprisoned because of this, but Greymane, he still saw him as a friend, and the city needed his help. Together, they fought back against the Worgen assault, but Crowley, he realized that the only way for the citizens to survive would be to evacuate them all to Duskhaven. He and his forces stayed behind to keep the Worgen distracted, while Greymane and the rest of their people evacuated. Crowley's sacrifice saved many lives that day, but at the price of him becoming a Worgen himself. The royal alchemist of King Gen Greymane had managed to create a potion which allowed the Worgen to regain their sanity and take control over their actions, even if it was for just a little while. These liberated Worgens, they joined the Gilnean's forces, and even though Alpha Prime had taken the city, their walls were holding. That was until the cataclysm hit the world of Azeroth. It shattered the Greymane wall and even the natural defenses around the city. This allowed the Forsaken to not only invade from the land, but they could also assault from the sea. The Worgen, there were no pushovers though, and their forces led by Prince Liam Greymane and Lord Vincent Godfrey, they were able to put up a fierce resistance. Unfortunately for them, the cataclysm was not over yet, and they had to evacuate Duskhaven before the land was consumed by the sea. The survivors, they fled to Blackwald, where they found the Night Elves led by Belrisa Starbreeze. Belrisa had actually been there when the first of the Druids assumed their Worgen forms, and she offered her assists and knowledge with restoring the balance between man and beast. The potion that was given Given to the Gilneans, it would not last forever, but the Night Elf's ritual would restore the balance and would allow the Gilneans to hold control over their Worgen forms. Crowley had already made his way to the Night Elves and he informed adventurers that the Forsaken had gotten their hands on the Scythe of Elune. This artifact would allow them to hold control over the Worgen, so they had to reclaim the item before it was lost forever. A pack of Worgen led by Tobias Mismantle, they distracted the Forsaken while adventurers stole back the Scythe before it could reach Sylvanas. After these events, Godfrey and Greymane, they showed up asking Crowley to join their forces once more. Crowley asked if Greymane requested their aid as a tyrant or as a friend, to which Greymane revealed that he himself had turned into a worgen, so he was asking this as a friend. Godfrey could not handle his king being one of the cursed worgens, so he made his plans of his own. He captured Greymane with the intention of using him as a bargaining chip with the Forsaken. The adventurers, they came to the rescue once more and they liberated the king, to which Godfrey decided that it was better to be dead than to serve under a worgen. After liberating and recruiting as many of the people as they could, Greymane and Liam got ready to fight for their city. The prince himself led their forces against the troops of the Forsaken as they fought their way to the heart of the city. There, Sylvanas herself showed up on the battlefield, planning to use a poisoned arrow on the king himself. But his son jumped in front of the shot and he died in his father's arms. Sylvanas retreated and she met with General Warhol, who was sent by Garrosh to keep an eye on the Forsaken. It appears you're losing control of Gilneas, Sylvanas. Garrosh fears he's going to have to carry out this invasion himself. You can assure Garrosh that this is a minor setback. Our victory in Gilneas will be absolute. You sound very confident, Your Majesty. 
I seriously hope you do not plan to use the plague. Garrosh has explicitly forbidden it. You do well to watch your tone, General. Neither you nor Garrosh have anything to worry about. We've ceased all production of the plague, as he ordered. We'd never deploy it without his permission. I will deliver my report to our leader, then. By your leave, my lady. Go with honor, General. My lady, should I order my men to stop the deployment of the plague? Or are we to continue as planned? What kind of question is that? Of course we're deploying the plague, as planned. Let the Gilneans enjoy their small victory. Not even their bones will remain As by tomorrow. You wish. Tobias missed Mental. He heard the entire conversation and he made sure to evacuate the city before they would all fall to the plague. <laughs> Sylvanas is in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen. No, we will not use the plague. Three seconds later. What kind of stupid question is that? Of course you're to deploy the plague. Ilneus was left in ruins, but its citizens had survived as they sailed away on boats delivered to them by the Night Elves. A new alliance was formed, they would return to fight another day, while the Gilneus Liberation Front, led by Darius Crowley, remained behind to try and retake Ilneus from the Forsaken forces. Meanwhile, Sylvanas, she presented the war chief with her new allies. Goodbye. Where is that ogre-headed buffoon? Ah. Speak of the devil. This better be important, Sylvanus. You know how I detest this place and its foul stench. Why have you called for me? And more importantly, what are those scourge fiends doing here? Warchief, so glad you could make it. With the death of the Lich King, many of the more intelligent Scourge became... unemployed. I fucking love her phrasing. Those fiends, as you so delicately put it, are called Valkyr. They are under my command now. And they are part of the reason that I asked to see you. Get on with it, Sylvanas! Very well, War Chief. I have solved the plight of the Forsaken. As a race, we Forsaken are unable to procreate. With the aid of the Valkyr, we are now able to take the corpses of the Fallen and create new Forsaken. Agatha, show the War Chief! What you have done here, Sylvanas, it goes against the laws of nature. Disgusting is the only word I have to describe it. Warchief, without these new Forsaken, my people would die out. Our hold upon Gilneas and Northern Lordaeron would crumble. Have you given any thought to what this means, Sylvanas? What difference is there between you and the Lich King now? Isn't it obvious, War Chief? I serve the Horde. Watch your clever mouth, bitch! Chromosh, you stay behind and make sure the Banshee Queen is well guarded. I will be expecting a full report when next we meet. Remember, Sylvanas, eventually we all have to stand before our Maker and face judgment. Your day may come sooner than others.
Garrosh is obviously not pleased with Sylvanas' actions, but she doesn't care what the Warchief has to say. The Valkyr are now her most powerful allies, able to resurrect the Fallen and make them fight for the Banshee Queen, something Sylvanas makes full use of as the war against Gilneas and the rest of the area continued. The Valkyr, they were deployed to convert the humans at Fenris Isle into Forsaken. But Crowley, he made use of this attack by offering the humans their Worgen blood. Embracing the Worgen curse would make the humans immune to the Valkyr's magic and it would prevent them from being turned into Forsaken. Even though they hated the idea to become Worgen, they still accepted it since it was better than to be turned into the undead. Around this time, Greymane had made his way to Stormwind and he allied with the Alliance. Givarian Rin, he realized the threat of the Forsaken and he deployed some of his finest troops to the liberation of Gilneas. The Seventh Legion was sent out to take back the city and they were actually successful. But Sylvanas, she had more plans in mind. See, the adventurers recovered the corpse of Lord Vincent Godfrey, the same Godfrey who threw himself off the cliff while our own troops recovered his lieutenants, Lord Walden and Baron Ashbury. They were resurrected as Forsaken, and Godfrey seemed to be more than willing to serve the Dark Lady. He had always said that it was better to be dead than to serve as a worgen, so he had no problem with being resurrected as an undead. The amount of cuckery that's coming from the former humans is just fucking unfathomable at this point. Every time they get resurrected and they see Sylvanas, they're like, Yes, my queen! God damn it. The adventurers, they were then put on the task of taking Ember Mill, one of the last Dalaran settlements in the land. Hey, a rumor had it that the mages at Ember Mill, they were waiting for more Alliance reinforcements before turning on the Forsaken, so they had to be taken out before they became a bigger threat. They too were turned to the undead, adding more and more forces to Sylvanas, her army. The Seventh Legion and the Worgen were not yet defeated though, and Godfrey and his men were set on the task of collecting Lorna Crowley, daughter of Lord Darius Crowley, who was leading the Gineas Liberation Front. Lorna, she was still unaffected by the Worgen curse, which meant that she was still vulnerable to Sylvanas and her Valkyr. Sylvanas went as far as to threaten Crowley, and she told him that if they wouldn't hand over Gilneas, that she would turn Lorna into one of her forsaken. Crowley had no choice, and he surrendered the city to Sylvanas, and the dame seemed to be one. However, Godfrey had other plans in mind. He shot Sylvanas point blank in her back, ending her life, and while the orc Chromash and the adventurers present, they quickly overpowered Godfrey, he did manage to retreat all the way back to Shadowfang Keep. The Valkyr had made a pact for Sylvanas and they worked on bringing her back to life. The first time that Sylvanas had killed herself, only one Valkyr had to take her place, but apparently that Valkyr was far more powerful than the rest of them. This time it took all three of them to bring Sylvanas back, but they were successful and Sylvanas came back from hell. She was furious at Godfrey and swore that she would get her revenge as she made her way back to the Undercity to recover. Godfrey, he would take an out in the Shadowfang Keep dungeon, but Gulneus to this day is still being fought over. Blizzard hasn't made an official story about this, but several tweets from reliable sources suggest that even though Crowley surrendered, several of his people did not. They still battled over the future of Gilneas, which we see in the battlegrounds. Later on, we have Creed who shows up. He was part of the Rogue Legendary questline. Refion, he sends rogues to take him out, and Creed's forces left the city for a safer place. Time will tell who might hold Gilneas in the future. For now, it's still disputed. More territories would be conquered by the Forsaken, amongst them the town of South Shore, which was obliterated with the use of the plague. However, the, the final battle that I want to talk about is the battle at Enderhall. Bo All right, before we go into that, Matt, you had something to say about Sylvanas? You had something to say about Sylvanas? Yeah, so, um, I just want to bring up this one line Earlier, so earlier he's, uh, Garth looks at Savannah and watch a clever mouth bitch. Ah, uh, yeah, we discussed it last week with how they removed that now from the game because apparently, several years after That's the fact, it is inappropriate, even though her actions may be interpreted as what do they call it? A bitch move. Being a bitch. I mean, we have what's called a dick move. Why can't we have what's called a bitch move? But, like, you know, what do I know? But that's what we were talked about last week. That's the line that he removed. And in Garros' way, I have to ask, what's the difference between you and the Lich King? 
he makes a good point, I... but also at the same time, it highlights how in that moment, I mean, she look, she calls him a, a ogre face buffoon, and in that moment, he says bitch. I mean, she disliked him at that point, but could you imagine being Sylvanas and being called a bitch? At that point, she decided, oh yeah, I'm gonna kill him. It, it, it sums up the relationship really well. Removing it takes a lot of the impact from the scene. It feels completely unnecessary and absolutely ridiculous. But as always, SJWs find a new and even of it, yeah, in and of it, in a, innovative ways to ruin everything. Um, speaking of the, um, in law wise, I think the Wagon should be. I don't know. Because I know Wagon cannot be brought back to life. So I'm not exactly sure if they can be immune to the zombie. In, in the story, it, they basically say dead Wagon can't be raised. So we just have to take that as fact. Because they can't yeah, raise him. So, so that's just um, basically. I don't it. think. I think in terms of it. Yeah, they would be immune to the zombie. Now, can they be killed? Yes. Wagon can, can definitely be, be killed. Back? Wargan in lore, yeah, they're immune to it. In the game, no, because that's just unfair. No, as in Wargan can be killed. They're still mortal. Even undead can be killed. It's I'm just Wargan can't be the, raised. I'm talking to somebody who asked a question in the chat. Oh, you have to read it first. Does that mean Wargan should be immune to the zombie plague event in pre-patch? Um... Uh, Technically, law wise, wise they yeah. should be, but game wise, game -wise, no, wise no. that's unfair. Yeah. All right, let's continue. The with the Alliance and the fair, Hordes, they fought over this territory not only with each other, but also with some of the remaining Scourge forces. The Alliance, they were led by the Death Knight Fasarian, while the Horde was led by Coltra Deathweaver. And those who've made a Death Knight before know that these two are very friendly towards each other. They meet on the battlefield, and after taking out Darkmaster Gandling together, they decide to retreat and regroup their forces. Fasarian, he warns his old friends that they are brothers no longer. Both of them, they've allied themselves with either the Alliance or the Hordes, and eventually they will have to face each other on the battlefield for the fate of Enderhall. We're told not to say a word about their little arrangements, but Sylvanas is no fool. Disguised as Lindsay Ravenson, she sends adventurers on the quest to use her Valkyr and convert the local farmers into forsaken troops. The Alliance also recruits and trains farmers to help with the battle, and these farmers attack first despite Fasarian's orders. It doesn't matter to Sylvanas though, she has seen enough of Coulter's weakness and she sends out her own troops together with the Valkyr to take on the Alliance. Even though the Alliance was able to defeat the Valkyr, the battle at Enderhall was still lost. There were simply too many troops for Take the City, and the Forsaken had won. Despite their victory, Sylvanas was not pleased. The battle should have been over days ago when they defeated the Scourge, so she grabs Coltera and she sends him to the Undercity. Arthas apparently had failed with creating his Death Knight. Sylvanas found them to be far too weak, but when she's finished with him, his weakness will be gone. Unfortunately for us, this storyline is left unfinished. Uh, Fasarian says that he will go to Tears Fall to find out what happened to Coltera and to take on the Dark Lady, but so far we haven't heard a thing about this. Who knows what Sylvanas is doing with Coltra and Undercity, but what we do know for certain is that the battle for Enderhall cost Sylvanas one of her Valkyr. The Alliance lost the city, but the Dark Lady is one step closer to the afterlife she desperately wants to avoid. Now after these events, Sylvanas and the Forsaken would take a step back as the story of the Cataclysm would focus more on Thrall and the Dragon aspects, while Mr. Pandaria opened up with the bombing of Fethermore. War Chief Garros Hellscream has the Horde attack Fethermore. He asked of them to gather their armies, and Sylvanas sent some of her forces, led by Captain Frendis Farley. She didn't join the battle herself though, and as most of you know by now, the armies gathered were merely to draw out as many of the Alliance forces as they could, so they could wipe them all out with a single bomb created from the focusing iris. This was one of the first steps of Garrosh using dishonorable tactics of him pissing off the other leaves of the Horde, and when he had his people assassinate Vol'jin, it was time for action. Vol'jin led the rebellion against Garrosh and his true Horde, while the Alliance and the rest of the Horde leaders, they joined for the Siege of Orgrimmar. During the siege, we see Sylvanas herself during the Warlord Zela encounter, and just before the encounter, she makes an interesting offer to Lorfmar. Bladefist Bay is fortified! By the sun well, we're getting slaughtered. Heroes, port over to the docks and take out their shore defenses. Put a stop to this bloodshed. I can raise your dead, Regent Lord. Your rangers can fight again. Sylvanas, 
You will leave our corpses alone, or I will deal with you here and now. I'm sorry to see your lack of commitment. Hmm. What of the human corpses? Well, I suppose that's between you and the Alliance, isn't it? <laughs> Rise, my angels. Let your screams fill the streets of Orgrimmar with terror. She offers to raise Lorfamar's fallen rangers, Blood Elves, which implies that her Valkyr can resurrect more than just humans. Obviously, Lorfamar doesn't want her anywhere near their fallen, so Sylvanas, she focuses her attention on Warlord Zela. After can we just, like... Point out again what a negotiator Sylvanas is. Let's carry on. Garrus is defeated. A new warchief has to be appointed. I want to point Voldy out steps up the fact and that, he takes. Um, go quick. Uh, I was gonna say I want to point out the fact that um, uh, the entire one of the things they taught us earlier is Rothamar has an issue. Tadness is standing up to her and 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 at the beginning of wrath. And now in Panda in Siege of he literally stands up to and says, I will deal with you myself. Which means touch our corpses and I'm going to kill you. I'm pretty sure sometime during that rage, she says something along the lines of, if you die, I'll resurrect you. It would be such a shame for your body to go to waste. So, like, when I heard it for the first time, I'm like, is she flirting with him? Is she hitting on him? Because that's how it no. came across. I... No, I think he's just trying to, um, throw out power. I think it's just a power move by her. I, I think he's overcompensating because he's been groveling at her feet for so long that he's like, look, i got to stand up to her now, otherwise I'm completely fucked. Because if I recall correctly, when she was Ranger General, she was his second in command. So for a long time, he's been her underling. And then he's leading Silvermoon, but ultimately she's the one that got the Blood Elves into the Horde. So again, she's his underling. In Wrath of the Lich King, she's basically like, you bring your army to Northrend. He's like, no. She's like, well, if you don't, I'm not going to support you. He's like, okay then. So you've got this long, long history of him basically doing whatever she says. Why is that every male character in the, game, in the Horde ends up being a cuck to Savannah? Because she's hot. Let's continue. That necrophilia. Let's continue. And I will quote Dangarompa. This corpse ain't gonna fuck itself, is it? Let's continue. <laughs> so Sylvanas, she focuses her attention on Warlord Zela. After Garrus is defeated, a new warchief has to be appointed, and Vol'jin steps up and he takes on the mantle of warchief. Sylvanas doesn't object, but she does have her own things to say about it. She says the following. Warchief Vol'jin. Does it sound absurd to you? I, for one, certainly won't be taking orders from a troll. But he put this little coalition together and won the day. He's also proven to be impossible to kill. I admire that. Time to test what he's made of. Sylvanas obviously respects Fulton's strength, but she won't be taking orders. Lorfmar says, I find politics exhausting. I'm confident Vol'jin would take us where we need to go. Lorfamar glances over to Sylvanas, assuming he can hold this horde together. Lorfamar knows what's up with Sylvanas. She's offering to raise his debt now. He knows that within the horde, Sylvanas could become a severe problem, and he hopes that Vol'jin will be able to keep it all together. We're going to talk about the possible future for Sylvanas in just a moment. First, we have to cover the events in War Crimes. War Alright, just to give a little bit of context, and we haven't touched Warlords of um, Draenor, which follows after this, and we haven't touched Mist of Pandaria. So to give everyone a quick little synopsis, um, after Wrath of the Lich King, a new war chief is named. This is Garrosh. Um, he's the son of, uh, what's his name? I forgot his name. Um, was it Grimash? Yeah, Grimash's son. Um, his war chief in Mists of Pandaria and Cataclysm. And as you can imagine, in Mists of Pandaria, he does a few little naughty things and he pisses off the entire horde who ally with the Alliance to assault Ogrimmar. They eventually defeat him and he is tried for war crimes. Uh, he dropped a the equivalent of a nuclear warhead on Theramore. He imprisoned the Red Dragonflight um, and 
pretty much forced the dragon aspect to um, lay as many eggs as she could so her children could be turned into mounts for his, um, you know, army. Um, he also committed several questionable acts, including a little bit of genocide here and there. So war crimes would be appropriate. I mean, did I sum that up it's about right? A little right? bit of genocide. I mean, he committed a little bit of genocide. Like, he basically killed anyone that wasn't an orc. And then he killed orcs that disagreed with him. So, like, if you want a real-life example, Hitler's a good one. He's practically Hitler. Now, I will ask this question a little later, but I want to know whether or not people want us to actually have a stream uh, on Garrosh. Because if we want to go into the story of Garrosh, that's kind of like an hour, 90 minutes worth of cutscene cinematics and discussion on its own. And that would lead into Warlords of Draenor. Um, so I'm going to leave that up to you guys. Let me know in the chat. But for now, let's see what the video has to say about war crimes. And don't worry, it won't spoil too much about Miss Pandaria. It's a good expansion. It's a damn fine story with amazing cutscenes and cinematics. Fucking beautiful. Crimes takes place after the Siege of Orgrimmar, in which Garrosh is placed on trial. The Argus Celestials are his jury, Torren Zoo is his judge, and the Horde and Alliance each have to present one member to either defend Garrosh or make clear that he deserves death. Sylvanas offers herself to be Garrosh the Defender, since it's well known that she often disagreed with Garrosh. The Alliance would never accuse her of going soft, but Vol'jin declines the offer. They're looking for someone to defend Garrosh, and Sylvanas, she would be a great accuser, but she couldn't offer Garrosh a fair defense, not the one the Celestials are looking for. In the end, it's decided that Tyrande becomes the accuser, while Bay needs to do his best to try and defend Garrosh. Sylvanas couldn't believe that it would actually go with this farce of a trial, but Bane actually did his best to honor his war chief request and defend Garrosh. Okay, to give a little bit of context why this is so significant, Bane is the son of the former leader of Thunderbluff, Thunderbluff being the capital city of the Tauren. Now, Bane's father challenged Garrosh to Makara, which is a fight to the death with melee weapons. What ended up happening during that fight was that Garrosh's axe was poisoned uh, by a faction. Um, and so when he struck Bane's father, Bane's father actually succumbed to the poison. In Garrosh's eyes, that was dishonorable in that it wasn't an honorable fight. And his victory was a shallow one. It was a hollow one. He didn't win honorably. So to him, it didn't count. But for Bane to actually go and defend his father's killer kind of showcases what type of person Bane is. Just to give you guys a little bit of context. Because a lot of people are like, oh, Bane is defending Garrosh even though Garrosh hated Torin. It's not that simple. He also killed his father. And, yeah. and Bane now leads to Torin. And he's young. He's young. He's a great fighter, but he's still young. You know, compared to the I'll rest say, of the leaders. I'll say this to anyone. If you want a good book, read this book. It's very, very good. One of the top books I made. I haven't read War Crimes, but from the um, extracts that I have seen, fucking amazing. I sincerely hope that they cover the Sylvanas extract. I think they will, but it's just on point. All right, let's continue. He did such a good job that Sylvanas lost her temper as they made their way out of courts. She even went as far as to call Bane a bootlicking alliance sympathizer, but that was one step too far. Bane, the powerful warrior, sees Sylvanas by her arm, and she realized that if he wanted to, he could snap her arm like a twig. I am not an alliance sympathizer, he said in a deep calm voice, nor do I lick boots. Vol'jin told Bane to let Sylvanas go, and he explained to Sylvanas that Bane was just doing what he, the war chief, had asked of him. Her wish of seeing Garrosh dead would come, she just had to let it come in its own time, but Sylvanas had no intention of sitting around and waiting. She just to point out here, Vol'jin basically saved Sylvanas a few... <laughs> a few fucking angels right there, just saying. Because if she died, she'd have to use about two or three Valkyr to resurrect. She knew that even the slightest chance of Garrosh getting away with his head on his shoulders was too much, so she started to think of a plan to make death come on her terms. Just as she was pondering these thoughts, a messenger arrived giving her a scroll and a small package. 
Once we were on the same side, perhaps we can be again, was the message on the scroll. Inside the package, Sylvanas found a necklace similar to the one brought back to her by adventurers. The inscription was also similar to her own necklace, only this one was addressed to her younger sister. To Verisa, with love. Illyria. The Windrunner reunion fans had waited for for years had finally happened. Verisa had heard rumors about Sylvanas of course, but she'd never truly dealt with it. The trial was the first time that the two Windrunner sisters locked eyes again, and Verisa had made contact for one simple reason, making sure that Garrosh would not survive the trial. The sisters met up at Windrunner Spire in the Ghostlands, where Verisa told Sylvanas that poison would be the best way to go. Garrosh was under heavy guard, so an assassin would not be able to reach him, but even prison have to eat. Sylvanas would supply the poison, while Verisa would put it in Garros' meal, but before any planning and scheming could happen, Sylvanas had to know. She had to know why Verisa, who had married a human, had found a home with the Alliance, was now going against the very laws uphold by that faction. Verisa tried to lie at first, tried to hide away from the real reason, but eventually the truth came out. He took my Ronin. That was all. That was everything. Silvana stepped forward and embraced her sister, and Verisa clung to her like the drowning woman she was. Sylvanas and Verisa made their plans to poison Garrosh, and as they did, they grew closer. Sylvanas felt emotions she hadn't felt in years, and she realized that she'd been very lonely. One day, she even asked Verisa to join her in the Undercity. Together, they could make their own laws and crush any who would stand in their way. Verisa actually accepted Sylvanas' offer, but what she didn't know was that Sylvanas planned on killing her and bringing her back to life. The Forsaken would not be willing to follow the orders from one of the living, and in death, Verisa would see the world as Sylvanas did. They would never have to be lonely again, and at first, Verisa seemed to be more than willing to join Sylvanas in the Undercity, until she remembered her two children. She had been so focused on getting revenge, that she didn't stop to think that the Undercity would be no place for her two growing boys. They would have to be left behind, and it would be the memory of her two sons that would ruin all their plans. Verisa had poisoned Garrus' meal, just as they had planned, but when she made her way back, she ran into Anduin, who was just about to go and talk with Garrosh. Anduin reminded Verisa of her sons, and she saw this moment as the light being at work. She told Anduin that she had poisoned Garrus' meal, and it was up to him to decide whether or not to warn him. With that information, she left Anduin behind, and she made her way back to Dalaran to hold her two beautiful boys, and naturally, Anduin did the only thing he could. He slapped the bowl of food out of Garrosh's hands just before he was about to eat. It was up to the Celestials to decide what to do with Garrosh, and poison like this was not the way to go. A messenger was sent by Anduin to Verisa with the news what he had done, and she said, Tell him Ronin thanks him. To give a little bit of context, now I haven't read War Crimes, I've only seen little bits and pieces and extracts. Uh, Anduin actually spoke with Garrosh quite a bit in War Crimes while he was awaiting trial as well as while he was going through trial. It's a very interesting story, especially considering how young Anduin is, but it's also because one day he would become the King of Lordaeron, so he's still at that very interesting stage of growing up where he's trying to find his creed in life, his path, the way he does things. His father, Varian, is a very kill every orc there is and ask questions later type of guy whereas Anduin decides to become a priest so his whole policy is against violence which is very interesting he's the polar opposite of his father and there he is talking with a guy who's committed genocide on multiple fronts and sparing his life it's very very interesting and this some of their conversations are really good now i am going to note that we did have a little vote on whether or not people want to see the story of garrosh and they voted yes so next week we're going to cover garrosh uh cataclysm sorry mr pandaria as well as wallers of draenor all right let's continue with the story of sylvanas um uh, there is some there from the extract uh that they went they touched on very little uh, well, they touched on it a fair bit, but uh, Verisa and Sylvanas actually got very close. And Sylvanas not only started to sort of hope that she could be with her sister, but she also started developing hope again that there was more to live for than just mere survival. And that keep res it keeps resonating the theme of hope, 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 hope. First, it was the amulet that reminded Sylvanas that was very painful. Now she's got the hope of her sister. Let's see how that ends. Sylvanas was also informed about her sister's action, and she wasn't as pleased. She felt betrayed by her little sister, and she rode out into the forest to vent her frustration to murder any that were unlucky enough to cross her path. 
Sylvanas fell to her knees. She buried her face in her hands and she wept. Wept like a broken child who had lost everything. Everything. Little moon. Gradually, the sobbing ceased and the familiar peace of coldness drove out the heated hurting. Sylvanas rose, licking blood from her lips. She should have known the pain she had felt at first. When she dare foolishly permit herself to hope for something different from what she had now. To feel something for another. To feel love again. It had been a warning. A warning that she was no longer made for feelings such as hope or love or trust or joy. These things were for the living. These things were for the weak. In the end, they would slip through her fingers, trickling away like the violet remnants of Jaina Proudmoore's apprentice Kindy, and she would be left alone. Again and always. Calm now through her tears and slaughter, she remounted her horse. Sylvanas Windrunner, the Banshee Queen of the Forsaken, would never again make the mistake of believing she could love. And that's where Sylvanas' story ends for now. Wallace of Draenor so far has little to no story to offer for the Forsaken, so we'll have to wait and see as to where they'll take this story. This next bit is going to be a little bit of speculation and a little bit of my opinion, so take that as it is. A lot of you have asked me what Blizzard might do with Sylvanas, and honestly, I think it's going to be very difficult to bring this story not so much to a satisfying conclusion, but more to a reasonable storyline. Her story up to the Wrath of the Lich King was all about getting revenge, taking out Arthas, while also offering a home to those hit by the plague. She got that revenge during the Wrath of the Lich King expansion and they had to give her a new motivation. This motivation apparently became staying out of hell, the Pact with the Valkyr, and now Sylvanas does the same thing to others as Arthas did to her. She is now resurrecting the dead herself, with a small side note that the newly risen Forsaken, they are offered a choice. They can either join Sylvanas, they can leave the Forsaken behind and go their own way, or they can return to the grave, which some use as an argument to make Sylvanas look a little bit better. In my opinion, it doesn't really. She might give a choice once they're resurrected, but she doesn't give a choice before ripping people out of the afterlife. You also have to wonder what kind of humans would stay at Sylvanas' side and actually fight their former allies, their former brothers and sisters. We even have one Forsaken that simply stepped away from Sylvanas because of all these actions. So all in all, I don't believe that offering a choice once the deed is already done is a real redeeming quality. Besides that, there are multiple occasions where she simply resurrects and offers no choice at all and she even uses her Valkyr as a blackmail method. We've seen this with Crowley, either you hand over Gonaeus or I will convert your child into an undead. This is a real threat, something that you don't wish on your worst enemy. Now there are several occasions where it's mentioned that something will have to be done with Sylvanas. Lord from the End of the Siege hopes a Vol'jin can deal with people like Sylvanas in the Horde, while Varian says, now to work of winning the peace. I would like to station a garrison near Fedamor. We need to investigate cleansing the plague from Gilnea land so they can rebuild. We must contain Sylvanas. So Varian, he wants to give the Gilnea land back to the Gilneans, but so far we haven't really heard anything about actions taken against Sylvanas or the Forsaken giving up the land in the first place. Blizzard keeps dropping hints that Sylvanas is somewhat of a threat, but at the same time they let her go on with whatever she wants to do. I think part of the reason to this is that Sylvanas has a massive fan base behind her. A lot of people that really love the Banshee Queen and her story and they don't want to see her as an emboss or something of an evil character. This is what makes it so difficult to predict the future for Sylvanas because on the one hand you have her doing evil stuff, while on the other hand you have people who don't want her to become a garage. So what can you do with such a character? Curing her from the undead curse, it, it leaves us with the same result. People don't want Sylvanas to go anywhere, so curing her doesn't seem to be an option. A Windrunner reunion with her older sister Illyria might be a way to go, but I think the events in War Crimes pretty much demolished any hope for redemption from her older sister. Verissa, she betrayed Sylvanas near the end of the story. She made her feel again, only to crush all hopes, and Sylvanas closed her heart once more. I don't see Sylvanas stepping away from her path, even if they bring Illyria back into the story. So the conclusion to all of this, the Dark Lady, she will go on with what she's been doing. She will get her lands, she will build up her troops, she will make sure that the bulwark against the infinite is mighty and strong. She has no intention of ever going back to hell and she will do anything in her powers to make sure to stay alive. If you ever wonder, like what might they do with the story, what Sylvanas might do, like becoming the Lich Queen or finding Frostmourne or whatever I've been suggested over the years, just ask yourself the simple question, will it help her stay alive? 
If yes, then she will definitely do it. If not, then she will try to find a way to bend the situation to her advantage. She will try to avoid the situation. All in all, Sylvanas wants to live. And she will do anything and everything to make sure she stays alive. To be fair, that is pretty much her motivation. If you were to go to hell, staying alive kind of top on your priority list. And this brings us to the end of my video. Like I said, the final bit was more of an opinion piece than actual lore, which means that you can have a different opinion about the Banshee Queen, and that's perfectly fine. If you want to share your opinion, please feel free to leave a comment down below, and I really hope you enjoyed these videos. I love the story of Sylvanas, I hope I did it justice, and I can't wait to see what Blizzard is going to do. Thank you all very much for watching, everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, and until next time, guys. See ya! Children of the grave, heed my call. In life, we suffered unspeakable tragedies. We watched as our homes were razed to the ground. We cried out in agony as our families were cut down before our eyes. Finally, in the face of such atrocities, we were denied even the release of death. Now, we burn this wicker man as a symbol of our victory against old enemies. We paint our faces with the ash to send a message to new enemies, a declaration to those who fear and revile us as monsters. To those who would question our place in this world, we are not monsters. We are not the mindless wretches of a ghoul army. No, we are a force even more terrifying. We are a chill in a coward's spine. We are the instruments of an unyielding eye. We are the Forsaken! That's a fun little um, thing that happens every Halloween. They burn the Wicker Man in Undercity, which is a cool little thing that's been happening every single year. I personally love it. It's so entertaining. Play of the game.